All right. Welcome, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. As everyone knows, this is our Timothy A. Johnson Medical Scholar Seminar Series. Um, this is a seminar series that is designed with our first year medical students and first year translational biology, medicine, and health students in mind, with the idea being that it's really important for our physician researchers and our biomedical science researchers to be working together. And so we, we design this series as, as a group and are always excited to have physicians come and speak who sort of embody this idea of collaboration um, across um, the biomedical research continuum, if you will. Um, so we, will ha we have these about every month. So our students, our faculty, our um, residents are all here to to hear from a series of speakers. Our next one will be in about a month. So we will be hearing from Dr. Leiter from Dartmouth, um, who'll be talking about apnea and sudden infant death syndrome. So keep that on the calendar for those of you who are on Zoom or in the room and don't normally attend this. Um, but I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Jessica Flieger from FBRI, who, who is going to introduce our speaker today. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Hussein Ardahali, who is visiting us from Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. Um, he is the Thomas Spees Professor of Cardiac Metabolism, the Director of the Center for Molecular Cardiology, as well as the Director for the Medical Scientist Training Program at Northwestern. He received his MD and PhD from Vanderbilt School of Medicine. He did his cardiology fellowship and internship at Johns Hopkins, and he completed a postdoc at Vanderbilt as well. Um, in addition to being a cardiologist, um, he is a leader in the field of cardiac metabolism, uh, publishing work in journals such as the Journal of Clinical Investigation, where he also serves as deputy editor, um, as well as in other prestigious journals such as Molecular Cell Circulation and Circ Research. Um, he's made seminal contributions to the area of, um, like I said, cardiac metabolism, but also metabolism in other tissues, looking at glucose and fatty acid utilization. He has also done a lot of pioneering work in the area of cellular and mitochondrial iron handling. Um, and as you saw from the paper that we read last week, the students in the room, um, he's a very meticulous and careful scientist. Um, he very carefully unpacks the molecular mechanisms that drive a lot of these processes, both in health and disease states. So he's a very, it does very impressive work. And today I believe he's going to talk to us about um, iron sensing in uh, maybe HEFPEF, was that a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Arda Holly. All right. Thank you, Jessica. You guys can hear me, right? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really delighted to see that your medical school has a curriculum that is uh, designed to uh, train uh, uh, really physician scientists. And I uh, want to today tell you about how, as a, a physician scientist, I was able to tackle a problem, which is basically studying iron in cardiovascular disease and uh, tell you how coming from a basic science background and clinical side really helped to, uh, you know, come up with, a, uh, um, you know, a new approach to this problem that is facing uh, cardiovascular disease. These are my disclosures. So briefly, I just want to tell you about the projects in the lab. The, uh, one of the projects in the lab is on hexokinases, and you're basically looking at this, you know, family of enzymes, uh, and we are trying to figure out how uh, you know, this family of enzymes evolved. If you really just need to uh, phosphorylate glucose, you only need just uh, one half of these enzymes, which is, you know, these are, I've shown them as two halves here. But these mammalian hexokinases have evolved and they are duplicated genes. That was my PhD project and I showed that these are duplicated genes, but they also have additional uh, components. And the paper you guys read, it's basically just on one of them, we removed the mitochondrial binding domain and we showed that it has significant uh, 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 pathological and physiological consequences. And what we are trying to do is basically dissect the evolution of these hexokinases but by, by deleting each component one by one in mice. So these are in living organisms and seeing how these mice respond. The other project that we are working on is uh, related to this protein called TTP, tristetroprolin. I'm gonna briefly talk about it, but mostly I'm gonna talk about this project, the role of iron in cardiovascular disease. And there is, you know, there is a gap between basic science and clinical science 
almost in every area of medicine, but you can't really see it any more than in the field of iron and cardiovascular disease. And that's basically why I think we need more physician scientists. And I really encourage every single one of you in this room, if you're medical students, please consider being a physician scientist because we need more of you guys. We need people who understand science and also understands clinical practice. So what's, what, why is it a problem? IV iron is, has, has, is already a billion dollar industry, as you can see here, is two, more than $2 billion. Uh, and uh, also by the end of this decade, it's thought to go uh, almost double. And the reason is because there is so much push towards using IV iron in, pa in patients with cardiovascular disease and with other diseases. So, um, and that's because of the guidelines. So uh, you guys are probably not familiar with the guidelines, but the, there are two groups of, or two major groups of guidelines that we get in cardiology. One of them comes from American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology. And the other one comes from, uh, from um, uh, European guidelines. So the one you're seeing here is actually the uh, recommendations from European guidelines, and they gave it 2A. Uh, and 2A basically means it's good to give it, there is evidence to give it, and they give it level A, meaning that there is great evidence, but the evidence or the benefits are not really clear. And then American guidelines are more careful. They gave it a 2B uh, indication, and 2B, it means that there is really not much evidence. It may be good, but there is not much evidence. So this is what we had until about two weeks ago, and the European Society of Cardiology happened in Amsterdam two weeks ago, and guess what? They gave it a class one indication for symptomatic uh, uh, relief. In patients with heart failure, they said give IV iron to these patients. And that's what I'm gonna discuss with you today, that there is probably not enough evidence. And this is probably uh, driven by, by so much emphasis that comes from people who uh, are they, they're really pushing for it, but there is really not enough evidence for, for, for the use of this drug in patients with heart failure. So over the past few years, we have published a number of papers, both in clinical uh, journals and also in uh, basic science journals. And we have been arguing that there is really, we have to be careful. We shouldn't push for this uh, treatment so quickly and we need to get more, more uh, 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 you know, evidence for it. Now, let me start by telling you about iron deficiency. So you're gonna learn that in, in your, uh, in your um, um, first year of medical school. So how do you define iron deficiency? So this is a blood draw, you're right. You measure iron levels, you measure TSAT, which is uh, 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 transferrin saturation, right? You measure ferritin, but the guidelines or what we usually use is, uh, is based on uh, ferritin. But there are two forms of iron deficiency. One of them is absolute iron deficiency. And that means your iron stores are reduced. Now, one thing that is very interesting about iron is that if you get infected, your body, and this is something that has happened throughout evolution. If you get infected, your body tries to withdraw iron from the bacteria, oops, sorry, from the bacteria. And by doing that, you have, you get functional iron deficiency. That's how we fight infection. We withdraw iron from bacteria so they don't grow. This is something that has happened throughout evolution. All mammalian systems have that. So in any kind of infl inflammatory condition, we get functional iron deficiency, all right? So that's not absolute iron deficiency, that's functional. And that's because we are, you know, the, some of the indices of uh, iron are reduced. But we have shown, and this is basically the work we did uh, with a, a couple of groups in Europe, we showed that the factor that we usually measure, which is hepcidin, hepcidin is actually not increased in these patients with heart failure. So people argue that heart failure is a chronic inflammatory condition, and that's why it leads to, to, to uh, you know, functional uh, ID. There is a little bit of inflammatory condition associated with heart failure, but it's not significant enough to cause a, an increase in hepcidin, which is the fact or the peptide that is released to cause more absorption of iron. 
And so what are the diagnostic criteria for, uh, for uh, ID, for iron deficiency? So ID refers to iron deficiency in my talk. So basically this is what the European guidelines have adopted. They are basically saying that if serum ferritin is less than 100, or if it is less than, or if it is between 100 to 300 in combination of TSAT less than 20. Now, you're, you guys are first year medical students. You probably don't know these numbers, but I bet you 90% of us in this room, our uh, ferritin is, uh, is uh, uh, less than 300. Probably all of us, our ferritin is less than 300. Unless you have an infection, your ferritin is probably low. Um, I'm going to talk about it, but I'm a firm believer in uh, blood donation. It has been shown if you correct for all factors, people who donate blood, they actually have less cardiovascular disease. So I was giving blood every three months and my ferritin got down to 11. And one of the side effects, you know, uh, one of the effects of low iron is anemia. But another thing that can happen is, is what a disease we call restless leg syndrome. So as you're falling asleep, your uh, legs jerk, and that happened to me. So I stopped giving blood. But, but you know, most of us in this room have our ferritin less than 300. But as you can see, these are very loose criteria. So if, you know, all of us in this room had heart failure, we would be getting IV iron based on this criteria. And why is that? Well, you have to, you know, companies have to sell their drugs. So to sell your drug, you have to be basically create more patients. So if the criteria are looser, you have more likelihood of selling your drug and uh, giving it to more patients. So this was originally used in patients with chronic kidney disease, but really for no reason, cardiologists uh, picked that uh, or adopted these guidelines. And now anything ferritin less than 100 or between 100 and 300 with TSAT of 20% is defined as uh, uh, iron deficiency. And this study has been done by doing bone marrow biopsy in heart failure patients. And if ferritin is less than 15, that really correlates with iron deficiency. So you can, as you can see, there is a huge discrepancy here between 15 and 300. And now you have, you know, a lot of people who are uh, being, you know, um, being uh, included in this criteria. There's a lot of epidemi epidemiological studies that uh, suggest that low iron is actually good for you. And, uh, but again, the one I like is that if you give blood, uh, you get uh, 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 your cardiovascular disease risk goes down. But uh, the other thing I like about it is that when you give blood, you get these snacks that my wife would never allow in the house. So I kept actually, I get my iron low, but I get my blood glucose up every time I give blood. So the studies are, you know, these are the original studies that came out. Uh, there were several, um, you know, smaller studies that were published until about uh, uh, three, four years ago. And they were not, Really, they basically suggested that if you give IV iron to patients with heart failure, their symptoms improve. There was no evidence of improved outcome. Do you guys know what outcome means? Outcome means that you have benefit in terms of uh, you know death or you know heart endpoints. But there was there had none of these studies suggested that. But just to show you how much people were pushing for this idea, I want to refer to this study, which is called Effect Heart Failure. And VO2 uh, refers to the uh, maximal oxygen uh, uh, in, the, in the venous, and the higher, the better it is. But what happened in this study, they showed that uh, peak VO2 is increased in patients who get IV iron. But the reason it was increased was because two people in the placebo group died, and they gave the value of zero. When you're dead, your PVO2 is zero. So that's how they showed this difference and now they're saying that PVO2 is increased with IV iron. But that basically shows how much they're trying to push this idea. There are a couple of, there are three studies I'm gonna tell you, and I think it's good for you to learn about these clinical studies because you will be, uh, you will be using that in, in your practice later on. But the first one is called Affirm AHF. And again, it basically showed that if you have, you know, in some of these patients with heart, uh, with heart failure, there is an improvement in symptoms. And there's also a reduction in heart failure hospitalization, but no improvement in outcome, uh, which was basically mortality that they were studying in this study. The next one I want to tell you is called Ironman. And this came out last year. And Ironman, again, showed benefit in terms of 
symptoms, but no benefit uh, in patients who, uh, or in terms of cardiovascular death. And this study just came out last week at the European Society for Cardiology. It's called HeartFit. And basically, if you look at the, if you look at the graphs, they were superimposed. There was no benefit. And this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, but it is surprising how much people are referring to this. And they're saying, well, if you look at some of the components, it, it, there was benefit. In fact, I just checked my Twitter account. Uh, we have been doing, uh, um, I've done a debate with, the, uh, with uh, Bob Mance, who is the uh, senior uh, or the, the senior investigator here. And also with, uh, uh, with uh, 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 Paul Carla. Uh, uh, Kalra, who is the senior investigator for Iron Man, and this uh, debate was uh, uh, was recorded a few uh, a couple of weeks ago. They just said in ninety minutes it's going to be released. So so I've been talking, you know, and I'm always on the other side. But they are really pushing for this IV iron, even though the studies are negative. But they're saying if you look at some of the components, there is some benefit. But all of these three studies were uh, negative. Now, I want to tell you about the FDA. You guys know about the FDA. FDA is Food and Drug Administration, and they basically give a label for every drug. And the FDA label for IV iron is very clear. You just give it to patients if they don't tolerate oral iron. PO means oral, in case you don't know. So you have to try oral iron first, and you also give it to patients with chronic kidney disease. So every time you give IV iron to your patients with heart failure, you, you're giving it off-label. This is not according to the FDA label. So now I wanna tell you about oral iron. And again, remember all of these studies, none of these studies, uh, uh, the IV iron went up against P oral iron. They all went up against, against placebo. And we talked about that today at lunch. Why is that? Because if a drug, you know, oral iron is cheap, you go to Walgreens, you pay $5, you get a big bottle of uh, oral iron uh, and that's cheap. So if you're a drug that is very expensive, it goes up against oral iron and it doesn't do well, well, you're, you're in trouble. You know, your drug didn't do well. So none of these studies went up against uh, oral iron. So oral iron is uh, basically works in the setting of iron deficiency. This protein called hepcidin is not, uh, is not released. Uh, in the setting of iron deficiency. So in your digestive tract and also in your macrophages, um, uh, the, uh, in your digestive tract, you absorb iron and in your macrophages, you release iron. But when you are iron uh, stores are high, hepcidin is released from the liver and you don't absorb iron and you don't release iron from macrophages, okay? And that's why hepcidin can uh, prevent, you know, iron absorption in the setting of functional, in the setting of an infection. So oral iron is, uh, ha again, hasn't been studied in patients with heart failure. There was a randomized clinical trial. So remember, RCT refers to randomized clinical trials, which are the gold standard for any clinical trial in, in, in our practice. And uh, they had to terminate it because they didn't have funding. Uh, you know, it was not, there was not funding, but uh, there are additional studies that are going on and I will discuss it in, in a second. But the people in, uh, in the field of heart failure, they refer to this study called iron out heart failure to argue that uh, uh, oral iron doesn't work. So what they did, they basically gave patients with heart failure either oral iron or placebo, and they looked at their uh, iron indices. And what they saw was that uh, uh, the peak VO2 didn't change in both groups. So remember, we are going now, we are uh, comparing P oral iron versus placebo. And I told you that IV iron doesn't increase PVO2 either, right? Unless you count those two dead patients in the placebo group. But I, uh, IV iron hasn't been shown to improve uh, uh, peak VO2 either. And that's the argument people use in the field. And they say P oral iron doesn't work because it doesn't increase uh, uh, peak VO2. But if you look at patients who had low hepcidin, they actually, they, their peak VO2 increased significantly. And those are the patients who are, who are truly iron deficient. But using this loose criteria, you're including a lot of patients who are not iron deficient. And if you're not iron deficient, you are not gonna absorb iron in your digestive tract. The only reason you absorb iron is because you're iron deficient. So those patients actually, they, their uh, peak VO, VO2 increased. And again, there, is, uh, there are some limitations with this study. Again, it didn't compare IV versus oral iron and IV iron isn't shown to increase uh, peak VO2. I already talked about that. And again, the majority of these patients didn't need iron. And again, remember oral iron 
may take longer to, to work. A lot of young women get iron deficient. And I don't know if anyone in this room has experienced that. My wife uh, was iron deficient for a while. And you have to take oral iron for a while before you get the effect. So it may take longer for, for it to have, uh, to have its effects. And what we know, oral iron, again, I had to take it after I realized my ferritin was low. It, uh, some of the forms of oral iron can have uh, significant digestive tract problems. I would wake up in the middle of the night with this burning uh, uh, feeling in my, in my mouth. Uh, but then I change it to a different form and it, I tolerate it very nicely. So there is a new form that is coming out, which is called microsomal, uh, 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 or, uh, or I'm sorry, sucrosomal um, uh, iron, and is absorbed much better in the digestive tract, is better, uh, and it has less side effects. And now there is this study going on, which is called Ivofer HF, and that's going to compare oral iron, the sucrosomal iron versus IV iron. So hopefully soon we will have more data. Uh, comparing, directly comparing oral iron versus IV iron. Now, there is, you know, there is this, uh, I, I just want to mention that there has been a lot of push towards correcting anemia for a long time in the field of cardiovascular disease, okay? So for a long time, we kept giving uh, patients who were anemic, we gave them blood. We gave them, uh, uh, you know, uh, try to correct their blood. It just doesn't work. In fact, it increases cardiovascular events. In, uh, you know, when I was a first year fellow, I was told do not ever give uh, blood to patients after they come back from the cath lab. And uh, there are several reasons for that. Number one, it uh, counts as a complication of the cath procedure and it's not good for the cath uh, attendings. But on top of that, it increases cardiovascular events. And then we started giving uh, erythropoietin. You guys are going to learn about erythropoietin in your medical school, but this is a drug that we thought would be great in our patients uh, who are anemic. It actually kills patients. We don't ever give it unless the patient's, patient has chronic kidney disease, which tells you that these two diseases, heart failure and chronic kidney disease, are very different disease conditions. You cannot apply one thing you get from one disease to another one, but it, we don't use it. So the, everything we have tried has failed in heart failure, and now they are pushing for IV iron, and there is really no evidence that it has beneficial effects. Now, going back, you know, I've told you about IV iron. I want to tell you about a different strategy, which is a chelator therapy. So chelation is basically removing uh, cations or, or uh, anions from, from the blood. So this trial called TAC trial compared uh, EGTA, which is a nonspecific uh, divalent cation uh, chelator. Uh, uh, those of you who have done biochemistry, you know about EGTA, EGTA and EDTA. So they gave it to patients and the results were so surprising. And this was sponsored by the NIH. It wasn't sp sponsored by any pharma companies. The results were so surprising that nobody believes it. Their patients who had diabetes or who had cardiovascular disease, there was more than 40% reduction in cardiovascular events or a stroke uh, and cardiovascular events. So these are hard outcomes, but the results again were so positive that the NIH decided to sponsor another study called TAC2. So TAC2 is gonna come out soon. Uh, if it is positive, that basically tells you that chelation therapy actually works. So which one is better, giving IV iron or giving chelation therapy? We don't know. And, and meanwhile, patients are getting IV iron on a regular basis. So that tells you that sometimes we push towards these therapies even if we don't know the whole story. I'm gonna talk about TAC trial to my colleagues. Nobody knows about the TAC trial. So, all right, so let's see. How do I get out of this? Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, now I wanna to talk to you about side effects of IV iron and I cannot mention it unless I mention my uh, hematology attending when I was a resident. He would come and yell at us if we ever gave IV iron to our patients because he said IV iron has side effects. You guys gotta be careful. So what are the side effects of IV iron? Uh, it can have caused oxidative damage to endothelial cells. It can cause uh, 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 the incidence of cancer. Um, uh, it can cause oxidative da damage to the kidneys. And also this thing is real. It can cause osteomalacia. There are several patients who had to get hip replacement because of the side effect of IV iron 
on their uh, on their bone and it's because of FGF23 increase. Yes. No, actually they haven't. But again, remember these were not done for a, for a long time. And uh, the, and the one that actually causes it is FCM. FDI doesn't the different form. Uh, but there was this paper uh, that came out uh, two years ago, and they looked at all of the patients in clinical trials who received IV iron, and there was a significant increase in infection, right? So there is this other side effect of infection that you need to take into consideration. Now, we are doing a clinical study. This guy, Matt Woodoff, uh, is one of the best uh, 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 CT angiogram imagers probably in the world. He can actually look at coronary vessels with the, with the technology we have now and tell you how much blockage there is in coronary vessels and how much of that is stable plaque versus unstable plaque. And as you know, unstable plaque is worse for the patients. So we are doing a clinical study. Um, uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm submitting three R01s uh, in two weeks, and that's one of them with, uh, with their group. So, uh, so yeah, that's basically what we are trying to do. So these are some of the myths about uh, IV iron and heart failure. I'm not gonna go over this in great detail. I tried to, uh, tried to go over them as I was uh, talking, but basically a lot of things are a lot of thoughts that has pushed towards using IV iron in heart failure is based on not facts. And being a physician scientist, that helps you understand how to tackle a problem, knowing you know, the science behind it and also knowing the clinical side of, uh, of, uh, of uh, cardiology. And again, remember, nutrient deficiency is not bad for you. Iron is a nutrient. At the time that we tell our patients, you know, don't eat too much, you know, uh, don't eat too, you know, too, many, uh, too, too much fat, too much glucose, why are we pushing for a nutrient like iron when we all we have learned that less is more? So this is something that uh, you know fasting, caloric restriction, we encourage that to our in our patients. But then on the other hand, we are giving them IV iron. And one thing I want to mention is that our body has learned how to deal with iron deficiency. There is a sophisticated system in place uh, to protect against that, and that's. Well, that brings me to the basic science part of my talk. I try to make half of, it, half of my talk uh, uh, clinical just to give you the foundation of why we are doing the uh, studies in our lab to learn more about the role of iron in cardiovascular disease. So over the past uh, few years, we have published a number of papers uh, on the basic science part on uh, uh, about iron in cardiovascular disease. And uh, the, this work uh, comes from the uh, or, you know, these papers come from the work that uh, uh, postdocs and um, uh, graduate students and uh, MD, PhD students in my lab have done. But basically, we concluded that if there is too much iron, especially in the mitochondria, in the heart, it's bad for you. And, uh, and we also learned how our body deals with iron deficiency. So this is what we learned, is that in, uh, if there is a reduction in mitochondrial iron, that's protective. And if you increase uh, mitochondrial iron, that can lead to my, uh, cardiac dysfunction. We also uh, studied iron at the cellular level. And we learned that there is a pathway a very sophisticated pathway called uh, through mTOR and TTP that is uh, activated in severe iron deficiency. I'm gonna talk about that too. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk about cellular iron sensing, which I believe you got the paper and you, looked, uh, you went over that paper. So I'm gonna just briefly go over that paper. So what did we learn about uh, 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 mitochondrial iron? When I was a fellow, you know, I was uh, uh, doing my fellowship with uh, Eduardo Marban, uh, and uh, I was working on mitochondrial potassium channels. And uh, one of the proteins I was working on was this protein called ABCB8. And the more I worked on it, the more I realized that this protein probably has something to do with iron. And my mentor wasn't doing anything with iron. And I told him, you know, when I go to Northwestern, I want to take this project with, with me. And he said, fine. If you want to work on iron, I don't care. You can do anything you want. So, so I took this project with me, and I basically we basically showed that ABCB8 uh, uh, is a uh, has a role in mitochondrial iron uh, export. So when you knock it out, uh, mitochondrial iron accumulates, and that leads to cardiomyopathy. Do you guys know what cardiomyopathy means? So cardio means heart, myo means muscle, pathy means disease, right? So this is a disease of the muscle of the heart. The heart doesn't pump very well. It's either dysfunctional or if the heart becomes stiff. 
So if you have dysfunctional or a heart that doesn't beat, you know, very well, we call it heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. That means the ejection fraction that should be around 50 to 65 is, or 55 to 65 is now down. But if you may also have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, that means the heart is stiff. The vessels in the body are stiff. So the, it's not as elastic as it should be. So the, uh, the blood backs up into the lungs and patients get, uh, patients get uh, shortness of breath. So this is basically what we showed that ABCB8 is involved in mitochondrial iron export. So when you knock it out, iron accumulates in the mitochondria and that leads to the production of reactive oxygen species. So iron is a very important molecule, but if you have too much iron, that can lead to the production of oxidative stress. So this is something you guys need to learn. Throughout your career, you, oxidative stress is bad for your patients. So whatever you can do to reduce oxidative stress is good for your patients. So that can, if you increase the reactive oxygen species, that can lead to uh, death, uh, cell death in the mitochondria. We also showed that it, uh, this protein has a role in the maturation of iron sulfur clusters in the cytoplasm. Now, so what I showed you is that if you increase mitochondrial iron, it's bad for the heart. The next question is that what if you re reduce mitochondrial iron? And there were, uh, and this work was done by a, a couple of really bright, uh, uh, you know, MD, PhD student and postdocs in the lab. And they studied the heart in the setting of ischemia reperfusion injury and also doxorubicin, doxorubicin induced cardiomyopathy. Doxorubicin is a, uh, is a cancer drug, right? So we give it to our patients uh, for various forms of cancer. And it's a really good drug. It actually revolutionized the field of uh, oncology. Uh, it was introduced in 1970s uh, or 60s, 70s. Before that, pediatric uh, or mortality from pediatric cancer was as high as 70 to 80%. And that after that, it was reduced significantly. So it's a really good drug. But a lot of these patients get cardiomyopathy. So they get referred back to us, to cardiologists, because their heart becomes dysfunctional. And it's a really bad disease because a lot of young people with breast, long, young women with breast cancer get uh, doxorubicin. And it's really sad to see them come to us and some of them actually get transplant. The heart gets so bad that they have to get transplant. So um, uh, what we basically showed in, the, in this, uh, uh, for these conditions was that, you know, in the setting of normal, um, uh, you know, normal mouse, if you give them doxorubicin or you subject them to ischemia reperfusion, they get cardiomyopathy. But if you find a way to reduce mitochondrial iron, then these mice are protected against doxorubicin and uh, ischemia reperfusion injury. So how do you reduce mitochondrial iron? I told you about chelators, right? So chelators reduce iron and there are specific iron chelators and there are specific iron chelators that can go to the mitochondria and reduce mitochondrial iron. In fact, there are one or two that have been developed. So these drugs are available and we are actually, we are studying them and we have studied them in our papers, at least in mice. And we have shown that they are protective against doxorubicin induced cardiomyopathy. So that was a summary of what we did in, uh, in uh, uh, terms of mitochondrial iron homeostasis. Now I want to move to the cellular iron homeostasis. This is something I've told, I told you before that our organs have learned how to deal with iron deficiency. I'm going to show you a slide, but we have been dealing with iron deficiency for 2 billion years. I'm going to actually tell, I have a slide on that, but over 2 billion years, we have learned how to deal with iron deficiency. So what's the mechanism for, for this? And uh, this work was done by a really bright MD, PhD student in my lab, Marina Baeva. And uh, she, she identified the role of this protein called tristetraproline or TTP in iron uh, deficiency. So what she discovered, so let me tell you briefly about TTP. TTP, the name tristetraproline refers to the fact that uh, there are three regions of four prolines. So tris means three, tetra means four, right? So tris tetraproline means that there are three regions of four proline. That's why it's uh, called, it has this name. But what it does is that this protein goes and binds to AU rich regions in the three, three prime untranslated region of mRNA molecules. And when it binds to those regions, it causes degradation of mRNA. 
So in your biochemistry, you're going to learn if you haven't learned that there is, you know, the regulation of gene transcription is at the, at the level of mRNA production, right? So there is a promoter. And if you regulate the promoter, you don't make much uh, mRNA, but there's an additional level of regulation at the mRNA level. You can degrade the mRNA that is produced. And this is how this protein works. It regulates the mRNA, but uh, the expression of an mRNA by, by uh, degrading uh, the uh, level, that uh, specific mRNA. So um, this enzyme, this protein was discovered by this guy, Perry Blackshear, uh, in um, 1989. And then he made a knockout mouse. And to his surprise, these mice get classic symptoms of systemic inflammation. They get arthritis, they get uh, alopecia, they get dermatitis. And he found out that this protein TTP binds to the uh, TNF alpha mRNA and causes degradation of the TNF alpha mRNA. So when you knock it out, TNF alpha goes up and it causes uh, inflammation. So that's how it works. But uh, in addition to that, we found that this protein also plays a role in iron homeostasis. And this is the work that was done by Marina Baeva. And she actually came up with this idea for the cover of the journal we published it in, cellular meta in cell metabolism. When she showed it to me, I said, this is really stupid, Marina. Don't send it to, me, to them. And they loved it. They put it under cover. And uh, so that shows you, uh, you know, people in my lab shouldn't listen to me. But, but this is what she, dis uh, what she discovered, that in low iron, mTOR gets inhibited, and that leads to a, an inhibition of uh, this protein TTP. So there's a double negative here. So low iron act actually activates TTP, and that causes, uh, 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 you know, uh, TTP to bind to the three prime UTR of uh, tr transferring receptor and uh, uh, reduce iron uptake, but it also leads to iron conservation. And that brings me to the last part of my talk, which is about the, uh, the idea of uh, how iron is sensed uh, in, uh, in, in the environment. This is a big area of research. So, uh, oxygen sensing led to the Nobel Prize two, three years ago, right? People who discovered HIF, they got the Nobel Prize. Carbohydrate sensing, I think people who discovered, you know, uh, uh, amkinases, they are going to get the Nobel Prize. Nitrogen sensing, people who discovered uh, mTOR, uh, they are going to get the Nobel Prize. So this has been uh, an area that is under intense investigation. How do our cells sense nutrients in the environment? When I was a graduate student, we wanted to learn how our bodies sense, you know, different nutrients in our body. So we learned about insulin, glucagon, right? Uh, at the systemic level, insulin and glucagon hormones that regulate systemic carbohydrate metabolism. You know, we learned about oxygen sen sensing through uh, erythropoietin that uh, increases the red blood cell production. But now we are going at the cellular level. Our cells can sense, especially cancer cells they can sense how much nutrient there is around and they would fight to get more of these nutrients. So how they do it, we don't know. And this is a really big area of research, but there's something missing here and that's iron sensing. And that's what I wanna talk about today. So this work was done by uh, another really bright MD PhD student in the lab and he identified a common iron sensor that regulates cellular anabolism. So this is basically what we use iron for. There is a list that I uh, have provided uh, here in this slide, but if you look at them, they're all involved in anabolism. Okay, if you don't know what anabolism is, the, so metabolism is divided into anabolism or catabolism. Cata catabolism means breakdown of, uh, of molecules, so you break things down. Anabolism means you build building blocks. You wanna grow, right? So you build the, uh, the bricks, uh, to, to build, uh, you know, to make, you know, to make, uh, to become bigger. So anabolism only occurs when the cells realize there is enough nutrient in the environment, okay? If there is not enough iron, you want to shut down anabolism. You don't want to grow, right? But nobody knows how this happens. And this is what really bothered Jason in my lab. And also the other thing that he bothered him was that if you look at, uh, you know, uh, life on earth, so the earth, uh, was, uh, uh, you know, came along about 4.5 billion years ago. Surprisingly, very soon after Earth was created, uh, life started on the, uh, on, the, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the Earth, and that was about 4 billion years ago. For 2 billion years, there was no oxygen around. And uh, 
And now, you know, you, you look at Science Magazine, every few months, there is a new article uh, regarding when this happened, when, the, uh, when oxygen came along. But for 2 billion years, there was no oxygen. And you know, the, the very primitive, the very basic requirement for life is, uh, is electron donation and acceptance. And this is what you will learn in your biochemistry class. So we used, or primitive organisms used iron and sulfur for that for 2 billion years. And then something happened and that was oxygen crisis. So photosynthesis started to occur mostly from oceans. We didn't have plants at the time. From ocean, you know, uh, we had uh, photosynthesis. So oxygen became available. So when oxygen became available, iron became oxidized. So oxidized iron, we cannot absorb oxidized iron. So that's when low iron became, iron availability went down. So for 2 billion years, we have been facing this issue of iron, low iron availability. So there has to be a sensor that is common among at least most of these eukaryotic cells that senses low iron. But the problem is that hasn't been identified. And all we know is that iron sensing, you know, in animals, I already told you about IRPs and uh, HIF, you know, uh, but yeast has a different system that has been identified. Plants have a different system. So nobody has identified a factor that is common among all of these species that senses low iron. And that's what basically Jason wanted to look at. So uh, uh, no common iron sensing mechanism and no process involving anabolism. And Jason basically went back to what Marina had discovered. And he looked at this uh, 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 slide or this pathway. And he said, well, there is something here that tells me that low iron inhibits mTOR. And mTOR is the a metabolism hub of the cell. mTOR, if it gets activated, anabolism goes up. So if you in inhibit mTOR, you inhibit anabolism. So he said, I want to discover how low iron inhibits mTOR. And that was the, uh, uh, his uh, project. Now, as you know, uh, mTOR is, uh, again, this is the metabolic hub of the cell. It responds to oxygen growth factor, amino acids. Um, and in response to those, it increases anabolism, right? So it increases cell growth, but nobody knows how iron has an effect on mTOR. How does it inhibit it? And this uh, work was done by Jason Shapiro, uh, re again, really bright MD PhD student in the lab with the help from, J uh, from Jimmy Chang. So the first thing he did, he showed that mTOR activity goes down with, uh, with uh, uh, low iron. So what you're looking at here is the mTOR activity. So this is a, you know, don't worry about the details here, but if, it, if this band disappears, that means there is uh, 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 mTOR activity is gone. As you can see, you go from this dark band to zero. So if there is no iron, mTOR completely shuts down. But if you show this to someone who works on, uh, on mTOR, they say, this doesn't make sense. The response of mTOR is usually within 45 minutes to an hour. And we are seeing this effect after 12 hours. So there is something that uh, there is a, so iron regulates mTOR through a pathway that hasn't been discovered before. Everything we know about mTOR inhibition is really fast, but this uh, inhibition is, uh, is very slow. And then he showed that this is unique to iron. I'm not gonna go over this. Now that was in, in tissue culture. What Jason also did, he said, does it actually happen in mice? So he made uh, pregnant mothers, uh, pregnant dams, uh, iron deficient, and the, uh, the you know, babies that were born, as you can see here, these babies are iron deficient. You know, or, you know compared the color of these uh, uh, you know, pups to these pups, they're, uh, they're anemic. And he showed that in the brains of these mice, mTOR is inhibited. So this actually does happen to, to, uh, to mice, and it happens in, uh, in, um, uh, in vivo. So, sorry, something happened here. It says restart, it says restart program. Sorry, technical difficulties. Yeah. Uh, so macrophages are, um, Oh, thank you. Macrophages are iron, uh, iron storage. Uh, so, uh, so that's a good question. Whether or not iron changes in iron has an effect on macrophages, that's something, there is one paper out that suggests it may be, 
uh, we are studying that in our uh, lab. We are knocking out ABCBH. So we are going to specifically look at mitochondrial iron and how it affects macrophages. But they're traditionally thought to be uh, iron storage cells. All right, so um, this is the pathway of mTOR activation. And Jason basically went through this pathway and he basically knocked, uh, uh, looked at each one of these pathways. And one by one, he showed that iron doesn't work through any of these pathways. And the one that it, iron works through is amino acid uh, uh, sensing of mTOR. So let me tell you how mTOR senses amino acids in the environment. So the major amino acid that mTOR senses is leucine. So there are, you know, 20 amino acids, but leucine is the major one that mTOR uh, uh, senses. And this is the work that was done by uh, David Sabatini. Uh, and he showed that even uh, leucine is not around, cestrin uh, 1 and 2 and 3, they inhibit this pathway. And there are several uh, pathways, several proteins in this pathway. And finally, uh, mTOR is kicked out of the lysosome. And when it is not on the lysosome, mTOR is not active. So that's why it happens quickly. It's, post, it's just protein protein inhibition and interaction. You see, you see the effect within 30 to 45 minutes. So this is how leucine works. And then uh, what uh, Jason showed was that in the presence, th there are a lot of uh, uh, you know, gels here. I'm going to go over them quickly because you don't need to know all the details. But what Jason showed was that uh, if you have uh, amino acid starvation, uh, the, uh, the, you don't see the effect of DFO, which is the iron chelator on mTOR. And he also showed that, uh, li uh, um, you know, in the absence of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, amino acids, lysosome, uh, or in the, in the presence of uh, uh, D uh, DFO, which is an iron chelator, uh, mTOR is kicked, uh, kicked out of the lysosomes, which again shows that lysosome is inactive. This is another confirmation of that. I'm not going to go over it. But the question now is that how does iron regulate cellular amino acid levels? So for that, uh, Jason looked at different amino acids in, in the cell. And thank God, the one that was significantly changed was leucine. And leucine, again, is the one that is sensed by mTOR. And uh, leucine levels were significantly reduced in the presence of iron chelation inside the cell. But one thing he found out was that leucine uptake was decreased. So there is a defect at the level of uptake of leucine if the cell is iron deficient. And what he uh, <clears throat> discovered then was that if you give leucine, you don't correct that uh, defect in, you know, in uh, mTOR activation, but if you give a form of leucine that can get into the cell, you can correct it. So if you bypass this uptake level, you can correct the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, defect that you see with the DFO in leucine uptake. Then he uh, tried to figure out what, and he showed that you know, the, these leucine uh, transporters, the, among leucine transporters, two of them, LAT3 and PAT1, they are significantly decreased. There are like six or seven of these leucine transporters. But the one that, is, that responds to iron deficiency is LAT3 and PAT1. There is a lot of, you can see, there is a lot of redundancy here because cells want to make sure that under, you know, that there is, uh, that they are able to uptake leucine, but there, is a spe there are specific ones that are not responsive to, uh, uh, to leucine. I'm sorry, that are responsive to iron deficiency. All right, so, so far I've shown you that in low iron LAT3 and PAT1, which are leucine transporters, their levels are decreased. And that leads to a reduction in leucine uptake and that causes mTOR inhibition. But I still haven't told you what this iron sensor is. What is sensing low iron to cause this? And to, to study that, Jason went back to, uh, to his studies and he realized that this regulation of LAT3 and PAT1 is at the transcriptional level. So that means it is at the gene expression level. And he also made this, uh, 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 you know, this uh, logic that most of the free iron inside the cell is actually in the nucleus. So he said the iron sensor I'm looking for must be in the nucleus and is involved in the regulation of gene transcription. And the one he focused on was uh, this Jumanji C histone demethylases. These are proteins that bind to iron. They need a number of things to be active. They need oxygen, they need iron, and they need alpha KG, alpha ketoglutarate. That is a substrate in the, in the, the TCA cycle. So they need these substrates. If there is a defect, if there is a low level of oxygen, if there is not enough iron, or if there is not enough alpha KG, 
these enzymes are not active. And what they do, they cause histone demethylation, okay? So again, in, uh, I think it's next week, they're giving the Nobel Prize. I think they will give it to the people who discovered the histone demethylase. They have to get it sooner or later. One of them actually, unfortunately, passed away a few months ago. So the, you know, one of the people who discovered it. So unfortunately, he's not going to get it. But, but this is a really big area. And you will learn about this in, in, your, in, in your medical school. I didn't learn about this. At the time, in, uh, when I was in medical school, this was being studied in yeast. Now we have learned that it plays a major role in, in uh, mammalian systems too. So Jason identified a number of these histone uh, markers are changed, and he identified two of them that he focused on, but which was H3K9, ME2 and H3K27, ME3. And he showed that only H3K9, ME2 in iron deficiency goes up, and when you add iron back, it goes down. That doesn't happen with H3K9 ME, uh, H3K27 ME2. So this is the marker we are looking for, H3K9 ME2. And uh, he showed that those markers are increased in iron deficiency. So compare this versus this here. You see there is more ticks here. That means this area in the promoter of LAT3, it has more markers of H3K9 ME2. And the same thing in PAT1. And the question is that what's the protein that is increasing this marker um, for, in other words, this is the slide, what is this protein that we are looking for? What is the Jumanji C histone demethylase that is responsible for this increase in H3K9 ME2? And uh, just to let you, uh, give you, you know, I'm not gonna go over a lot of details here, but he, he did a lot of work. He knocked out a lot of this uh, KDM uh, proteins and he identified KDM3B to be responsible for the response of iron deficiency on mTOR. So I wanna show you how detailed his uh, experiments were. So what we are looking at here is, uh, uh, is uh, mTOR activation. So as you can see in normal cells, you see, mTOR deactivation or inactivation in iron deficiency, right? So this is what you see, the, the band is gone. When you knock out H3K, uh, KDM3A, the effect is still here. But when you de delete KDM3B, the effect goes away, okay? And he showed that, that the same thing, that this happens to LAT3 and PAT1. And then, uh, sorry, it's not moving again. This, Oh, there we go. Okay, it's more. Yeah. All right. So, um, and then uh, we collaborated. We looked at the, uh, um, uh, you know, KM for the binding of KDM3B, and we identified it to be in the in a range that happens inside the cell. But then he just to confirm that happens. That's correct. He looked at his KDM3B knockout cells, and then he added KDM3B back. So here is a, a cell that has KDM3B deleted. You see that the effect goes is not there. But when he added KDM3B, the effect came back. And when he added the mutant KDM3B, the effect wasn't there. So that's just confirmation, right? So this is how we do, how we do molecular biology. We remove something, and if we have to, we put it back, and we have we put the mutant back. The wild type uh, form should bring the uh, phenotype back, then the mutant should uh, not be able to do that. All right, so. And then uh, uh, Jason being a great scientist, he collaborated with uh, investigators in Spain and also with uh, collaborators at the University of Chicago and showed this actually does happen in plants and yeast. So this is a summary of what I told you. In iron deficiency, what happens is that KDM3B is inhibited. So this uh, KDM uh, H3K9 ME2 uh, marker is increased in the promoter of uh, LAT3, uh, and PAT1, and also another uh, component I didn't talk about, Raptor in mTOR, and that leads to inhibition of mTOR and less leucine coming into the cell. So mTOR is completely inhibited. So under these conditions, the cell says, I don't care how much amino acid there is in the environment. I don't care how much glucose there is in the environment. If I don't have iron, I'm gonna shut down anabolism completely, right? because it's inhibiting mTOR at the transcriptional level. It's removing mTOR from the cell. But in other conditions, in like, uh, you know, leucine deficiency, the components of mTOR are there, but there is a defect in the pathway, you know, and I showed you the pathway. So this is how important iron is to our cells. It takes 
if you don't have iron, the cells wouldn't, wouldn't replicate. They shut down everything and they don't care how much more nutrient you have in the environment. So this paper is actually coming out on Monday in Nature Cell Biology. And finally, I wanna thank my lab. The work, you know, most of this work was done uh, that I told you was done by Jason here. But before I end, I just wanna tell you, you know, some of, a lot of, uh, you know, I had at lunch, we talked about the role of physician scientists. And I wanna tell you how great it is, at least to me, to be a physician scientist. And I wanna tell you that physician scientists at the national level are highly valued. We have our own honor society, it's called ASCI. I was uh, honored and uh, um, you know, I was uh, really honored and humbled to serve as the president of this society uh, uh, a couple of years ago. It's an honor society. Uh, usually every year we get like two people from Northwestern who become members and it's all over the news. And I really encourage you at some point, uh, you know, in your career, you will hopefully be, be part of it. And our journal is JCI. And uh, we have JCI at Northwestern and um, uh, I have been serving as the deputy editor. These are the criteria. We have 3000 members and it's, uh, it's more than a hundred years old. It's, a, it's the, one of the oldest societies. We have scientific sessions. This is what I started during my term as the president and we have it uh, uh, once a month and uh, speakers are usually Nobel laureates. It's free and open to everyone. If you want, I can, uh, you know, send the emails maybe to Nikki if you want to forward it to our to your uh, to your uh, students. We have the journal and uh, 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 JCI is now uh, at Northwestern. JCI Insight is at the University of Michigan. Beth McNally is the editor, and I serve as the deputy editor. It's a great journal. Uh, if you're doing basic science or uh, clinical uh, uh, work, I encourage you to submit it. It's tough to get in, you can get papers in, but I encourage you to, to submit. With that, thank you so much, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Jessica. Does everybody hear me? Okay, so my first question is that it looks like the LAT3 levels go down linearly in response to um, iron pleation over time. And then you show that mTOR kind of falls off at the 12 hours. Do you think it has to do with um, like a threshold of, of leucine uptake? And is that like, did you look at that over time as well? I know you showed the uptake being reduced, but does it also decrease over time? Or do you think that that has more to do with the mTOR like raptor component of the pathway? Uh so I think it's a combination of those two, because, you know, um, uh, remember leucine, when you uptake leucine into the cell through LAT3, uh, when you stop uptaking, there is still leucine in the, in, in the cell. So it takes a while for that leucine to, to go away. But on top of that, you also have leucine in the lysosomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that leucine can get uh, exported into the, into the cell. And on top of that, there is this new mechanism that is uh, independent of LAT3 that you can still bring uh, leucine into the cell. So that shows you that iron has decided to have this redundant pathway, not just rely on leucine uptake. It also goes and targets raptor to inhibit mTOR, just to make sure that mTOR is completely shut down. And then my second question is, tying into the first part of your talk, have you looked at this pathway in response to iron overload? So, or excess iron, does that downregulate the methyltransferase? Or yeah, so uh, I don't think it has anything to okay. do with iron overload. What happens in iron overload is that you get oxidative stress. And then when you get oxidative stress, you're going to damage so many different things. Do you think that's but, mostly mitochondrial? Or uh, no, I mean, iron, oh, iron oh, uh, oh, through oh, Fenton oh, reaction. Yeah. You know, Fenton reaction causes an increase in, uh, um, um, you know, uh, in, um, oxidative stress and that causes damage to a number of different pathways in the cell. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, great talk. Um, I was just wondering if you look at the expression of KDM3 in hot fever patient, um, I was just wondering if it can be a good therapeutic target. Uh, yeah, we haven't looked at KDM3B in, in heart failure. Uh, these studies I showed you, they were not in heart cells. They were all in, uh, uh, you know, uh, hex cells. So um, could be, I mean, people are looking at these KDMs in different uh, 
um, in, in the heart. And by the way, we uh, identified this KDM3B to be the iron sensor. So Bill Kellen, uh, who you know, discovered HIFS, he had a paper in science uh, you know, a couple of uh, months or years ago, and he showed that KDM6A is the uh, oxygen sensor. So now people, you know, the people were looking at HIF, they were looking at IRPs as the sensors for iron and oxygen. Now we are learning that there's also sensing at the, uh, at the epigenetic level. And by doing that, basically the gene expression completely goes away. So, yeah. Um, I'm curious whether or not iron deficiency is also implicated in HEF-PEF or other non-hypertrophic cardiomyopathy conditions as well. Yeah, I doubt it. I mean, uh, 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 people have been proposing to use, uh, to give IV iron to patients with PEF-PEF, but that hasn't uh, gained uh, traction. So uh, there's no real evidence. You know, who knows? Maybe in the future, people will do more studies in HEF-PEF and something may come out. But at this point, there is not enough evidence for that. Um, I know that branched chain amino acid catabolism occurs in the mitochondria um, and is associated with platelet activation. Um, so I was curious if you're seeing in low iron deficient patients a reduction in BCA, BCAA catabolism and then potentially increased or reduced platelet activation. Uh, yes, yeah, so that, we haven't looked at that directly, but we know that one of the targets of TTP is, uh, is uh, one of the key enzymes in branching amino acid metabolism, uh, which is BCKDC. So the E2 component of BCKDC is, or branch chain uh, 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 decarboxylase uh, is, uh, I don't know what the K is, but decarboxylase, the, the E2 component is a target of TTP. And we know that in low iron, TTP goes up. So that would inhibit branch chain amino acid metabolism. So we know in iron, and we have shown in iron deficiency that happens. So to, to answer your question about platelet ag aggregation, we haven't looked at that. So that's a good question, but yeah. All right, oh, there is one here, yes. Um, I was just curious if you could speak a little bit more on what therapeutic directions all these new findings may take? Like, would it be direct, like thinking about chelation or would it be something more complex than that? My money's yeah. in the second part. So a lot of patients are getting IV iron, but there are a lot of patients who are going to these chelation centers. There are chelation centers all over the country. People go there and they get chelation therapy. And uh, whether or not, and some of them are very aggressive. There are some people who have actually ended up in, in the hospital and uh, I know at least of a case where somebody was uh, uh, actually coded because the, uh, the chelation therapy was uh, very aggressive. But at least some form of chelation therapy may, may be beneficial in these patients. If TAC2 comes out positive, then we have to give EGTA to our patients. So if you give EGTA to, your, to our patients, how can you give IV iron in the setting of EGTA? So we have to you know, step back and look at this whole therapy again. If it comes back positive, it's, how can you not make that part of the guidelines? I mean, they made this part of the guidelines, IV iron, without enough evidence. But if, you know, if chelation therapy shows benefit in terms of outcomes, you have to put it in the guidelines. And then you cannot give IV iron to these patients. So, yeah. yeah. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.